episode 3 of Tintin's audio adventure series. Welcome to it. My name is Alan, hoping that you are doing well whenever you are listening to this, wherever you may be in the world right now. It has been several months since the previous episode. Apologies for that. I think you've waited long enough. I'll bring you up to speed about what's been going on at the end of the episode because initially this should have come out in November last year 2022 but for those of you who are unaware in November was when we had to move from where we were staying before to the current location now so I have to bring you up to speed on, on that why we had to move and everything so please Stick around for the end of the episode to find out what happened. Um, but like I've said, you've waited long enough, and today we've got quite a big book to get uh, through. So without wasting any time, let's jump right into it. This is episode 3. We're looking at book 3 in The Adventures of Tintin by Belgian artist Hergé. And book three is called Tintin in America. As you may remember back in episode one, we found out that Hergé had wanted the first adventure for Tintin to be set in America. There are some reasons for that. I'll talk about them when we get into the notes for Tintin in America. But as you as you may, may remember, Things didn't go um, in Roger's favor because his boss had suggested that Tintin's first adventure should not be in the USA, but instead Tintin ended up going to the USSR. And that's how we ended up with Tintin in the land of the Soviets for book one. And then book two, Tintin went to the Belgian Congo. But now, book three, Third times the charm, Tintin goes to America. So, this book was first serialized in the children's supplement known as the Little Twentieth. It was the children's supplement of a Belgian newspaper which was known as the 20th Century. It was serialized from the 3rd of September 1931 to the 20th of October 1932 and then released as a collected volume that same year. Je would uh, go on to redraw Tintin in America for Casterman in 1945 and it would be released in color. Um, it would be in the 40s when Je would start redrawing his uh, earlier books because at that point he had mastered the art style that he's known for, the clear lines art style. So he just decided to redraw uh, the earlier books and this is one of them. The, uh, that particular version, the 1945 color edition, that's the one I was reading for this episode. Unfortunately, I don't have the original 1932 black and white edition. It would have been great if I had that one so that I could compare that first edition with the 1945 edition. But I don't have it. It turns out also that in 2020, a color version of that 1932 edition was released by Moulin's Art, with Moulin's Art, with Michael Farr. Um, offering the English translation. Uh, Michael Farr, he is uh, known as an expert um, on Tintin among many other uh, uh, people. I'll put a link uh, in the show notes if you want to learn more about Michael Farr, his, his Wikipedia page. Uh, so it would have been great. That particular version, it would have been nice if I had it, but I don't have it. What I did find, though, was is a website which uh, where you an online bookstore 
where I found uh, this book being sold. I'll put a link to that as well in the show notes. And if anyone is willing to get that book and send me a copy, what I'll do is I'll record an extra episode of Tintin's Audio Adventure series where I'm just reviewing both versions, that 2020 edition and the 1945 one to compare and find out what the difference is especially when it comes to translation because this 1945 one would be translated by uh, the English version would be translated by Leslie Lonsdale Cooper and Michael Turner who translated the other two books and would translate the uh, later uh, books of Tintin. So please check the show notes for that link and if you can get that book please do. So let's continue now, get into the story. It is 1931 and we are in Chicago, Illinois where, quote, gangster bosses ruled the city, end quote. And we see an office somewhere in Chicago where one of these uh, gangster bosses is telling his men that the world's number one reporter Tintin is on his way to Chicago to take on the gangsters. This particular gangster boss, you should know him, it's Al Capone. And if you go back to book two, that was when we first heard uh, mention of Al Capone because when Tintin was in Belgian Congo, he discovered an illegal diamond um, operation that was going on and he stopped it. And he found out that that operation was going on belonged to Al Capone. So we come to this book now, following up from book two, where Tintin, having left the Congo, is on his way to America. And Al Capone, anticipating Tintin's arrival, is telling his men to be on the lookout for Tintin. As you'd expect, Capone is still very upset about that operation being stopped. So now he expects his men to get rid of Tintin. Speaking of Tintin, we see him and Snowy, they arrive in Chicago by train and then they travel by taxi to the Osborne Hotel. But the taxi driver, he's got other plans for Tintin and Snowy and suddenly there are steel shutters that come down over the back seat windows of the taxi trapping Tintin and Snowy inside the car and they are 10 miles outside of Chicago and that at this point where one of the taxi's rear tires suffers a puncture so the driver has to pull over steps out he manages to replace that puncture tire with a new one and then he continues driving to Chicago but unaware the driver doesn't know that Tintin and Snowy they bailed out of the taxi thanks to Tintin having brought along a saw that he used to cut through one of the back seat uh, doors and him and Snowy they, they bailed out of the taxi so it's a good thing for Tintin to have his, uh, these extra tools that he's carried along with him. That's how he was for years. So now they're out of the taxi and they have to walk back. Actually, yeah, they were 10 miles outside of Chicago. They had passed Chicago. So now Tintin and Snowy have to walk back to Chicago. And along the way, they see a police patrol motorbike coming along. So Tintin, he waves it over. Uh, the, the bike stops. There are two cops on the bike. And Tintin, he asks the cops if they can catch up to the taxi since the driver had tried to kidnap him. So Tintin and Snowy, they each ride with the cops and they race after the taxi. Eventually, they catch up to the taxi, the driver, seeing that cops are coming towards him, he pulls over 
and is arrested on the spot. And so now Tintin, he has his chance to speak to the driver and hopefully find out why he tried to kidnap Tintin. And the driver explains that he was promised 500 US dollars if he succeeded in kidnapping Tintin. But before he can reveal the location that he was supposed to transport Tintin to, the driver is suddenly struck by a random flying boomerang that comes from this, this unknown man who is uh, hiding behind a tree nearby. And once the, dri the driver has been knocked out, this unknown man, he proceeds to hijack the police patrol bike and he speeds off. So this leaves Tintin and the cops, they ended up hijacking the, the taxi and they chase after this other guy. Now, they are on the way back to, to Chicago. So this guy who's on the, the police bike, he sees the taxi is coming and he's hoping that his associate, Butch, he is standing nearby with the car, or else uh, this man, he fears that he'll be in serious trouble. Butch is certainly there. He's waiting at a junction in Chicago. He's in a red car, and as soon as the, the taxi comes along, he smashes this red car into the taxi. And, of course, causes an accident and there's a big crowd of people they gather at the scene of the accident they're shocked and surprised by what has just happened an ambulance arrives Tintin he is uh, picked up taken to the hospital and he spends some some time recovering at this hospital all of this going on just as soon as Tintin arrives in America so as you can say yeah, this is Welcome to America, Tintin. So days later, Tintin and Snowy, they leave the hospital and they are now on the streets of Chicago just in time to see rush hour traffic. But unknown to them, uh, while they are you know, just standing watching the traffic, they are standing on a section of the sidewalk that turns out to be a trap door. So they fall under. The, the sidewalk and they end up in this underground room where Tintin is attacked by these two thugs and then he's carried off to another room. Uh, Snowy, fortunately, he wasn't spotted by these other, uh, those two thugs so he's unseen and he follows after them. Tintin regains consciousness just as the boss of those two thugs enters the room. It's Al Capone and he's pleased that Tintin has been brought to him and he, he pays the two thugs and he orders, he orders them to, to deal with Tintin so he won't be a bother to Al Capone anymore. One of these thugs is named Pietro. He remains in the room while Al Capone and uh, one of the other thugs, they, they leave. So Pietro, he takes out a gun looking to kill Tintin. Uh, as for Snowy, he climbs up onto the top of a shelf and he drops a blue vase or is it vase on Pietro's head just before he fires the gun at Tintin and Pietro is knocked out. Uh, Tintin he picks up the gun and then he goes over to the door of this room he looks through the keyhole, hoping to figure out where he is, what is this place, what's going on. Meanwhile, behind him, Pietro he wakes up, he finds another vase on the shelf, and he throws it, aiming for Tintin. Only for Tintin, he manages to avoid the vase because at that moment, the door opens, and that vase ends up hitting Al Capone square in the face and uh, Tintin he goes over to attack Pietro and then after he takes him down he runs out of the room with the, the second thug who had gone out with Al Capone before he's also armed with a gun he chases after 
Tintin. So Tintin running ahead, he ends up hiding behind a curtain just outside the room. And that second thug, he comes running past that spot. And once he's gone, Tintin re-enters the first room just in time to see uh, Pietro. And then he ties up. Uh, Pietro is waking up again. So then... So then Tintin ties up Pietro and he ties up Al Capone as well. And then he takes a wooden chair and waits for the other thug to come back into this room. And just as he comes in, Tintin hits him over the head with that wooden chair. Those two are the Chicago gangsters. Zero for them. And that's one victory for Tintin. So Tintin, he makes it back outside, back onto the streets of Chicago. He finds a policeman and reports that he has caught Al Capone and two of his men. And as you can imagine, if you've got a copy of Tintin in, in America, when you have a look at this scene, you'll see that Tintin, as he's talking to this policeman and explaining that, oh, he just captured Al Capone and his two thugs, he still has the gun that he picked up in that room. Not a good idea while he's speaking to this to this policeman, as you'd expect. But uh, this policeman, after hearing Tintin, he responds by you know, hitting Tintin with his nightstick. And then he turns to use a nearby telephone. Those are old telephones that are um, attached to a pole. So he makes a phone call and he calls for a squad car to come and pick up Tintin. This random guy who shows up claiming to have caught this famous gangster Al Capone and his gangsters. But as for Tintin, he doesn't understand why this cops uh, would why the cop reacted the way he did and he tries to tell him again about capturing Al Capone but the cop is not listening he attempts to hit Tintin again so Tintin he decides okay this isn't working he runs away he sees another policeman uh, coming down the street but lucky for him there's an alleyway just off the side so he turns into the alley to escape leaving the, the two cops who were chasing after him to, you know, bump into each other now. So Tintin, he ends up in another street and he escapes that underground room without snowing. Just to, to uh, just let you know, he's without snowing. And he's wondering now how he can return to Al Capone's place and rescue Snow. So eventually Tintin ends up at a this uh, refreshment stand and you know while he's having a drink and you know thinking about Snowy he turns and coming down the street here comes Snowy um, even the the man who's running the refreshment stand he, he's surprised by this and afterwards Tintin and Snowy have been reunited they make their way to the Osborne hotel and on the way uh, Snowy is recounting what had happened to him in that underground uh, place. Someone had arrived and untied Al Capone and his men and Snowy he claims to have tried fighting uh, this fourth man who had shown up but he realized that he was outnumbered so he escaped but he can't really be sure since this is Snowy um, recounting what happened. So these events may or may not have happened. That's uh, the Snowy for you. So we make it to the hotel and um, in the lobby is another gangster who is waiting for, for Tintin. He's uh, seated on a couch. He's hiding um, behind a, a newspaper that he's reading while Tintin and Snowy are uh, escorted by a bellhop to their hotel room. So once they are in the hotel room, Tintin arrives and he finds there's a note 
waiting for him on a table. This is what the note says. Tintin, I'm warning you one last time. There's a train to New York in the morning at 11.55 a.m. Be on it. Then take a boat to Europe. Then take a boat to Europe. Quit Chicago by noon tomorrow or your life won't be worth a plug nickel. I'm not sure how much a plug nickel is back then or now, but that's, that's the letter that Tintin finds. It turns out to be a note from Al Capone. But Tintin is not intimidated. He tears up the, the note. He's not worried about Al Capone's threats. I mean, how brave is this guy? You know, this is Al Capone wanting him to leave. So the next day, at 11.55 a.m., the phone rings the hotel room. Tintin goes over to answer the phone, but there's no one on the other end. Meanwhile, the gangster from the lobby from the previous day, he has made it into the hotel room and is hiding behind an open doorway while Tintin answers the phone. He thinks that Tintin hasn't noticed him, but Tintin has noticed him because there's a mirror that is just off to the side and it faces that the door. So Tintin has noticed the, the gangster. So what he does, he sneaks into um, another room, he goes to a nearby open window, he climbs out onto the ledge and this this is a, a, a very high up if you have the, the book. Take a look at this, this, this particular page. Uh, this hotel room is several floors up there, over 30 floors high up, and Tintin is on the ledge. So he crosses from one window to another window, while the gangster, who has uh, been hiding behind that doorway, he is left wondering, oh, what's going on? Where? Uh, how come Tintin hasn't shown himself? You know, Tintin, he climbs back into the hotel room through this second window. He has his own gun, tells this gangster to put his hands up, which catches him by surprise. He drops his weapon as Snowy, he picks up the weapon and takes it away. And then Tintin heads over to the phone. He calls the police, and not long afterwards, uh, two men arrive. One of them is uh, dressed like a, you know, the classic detective look, the, the trench coat, the fedora, and the other one, he's in, he's in uniform, uh, this black police uniform. So the, the detective looking guy, he thanks Tintin for catching a dangerous criminal, while the, the guy in uniform, he arrests the, the gangster. And then the detective asks Tintin to accompany them back to the station. So they leave the hotel, they head for the station in a green car, which should already, you know, be a red flag because shouldn't they be traveling in a police car since they're supposed to be cops? But when they arrive at uh, their destination, um, Tintin finds that the so-called station is a rather shady looking place. But fortunately for him, he brought his gun with him just uh, to be on the safe side. The, the uniformed man, he leads Tintin to a door that has a sign hanging on it which reads police. Another red flag. And Tintin, he walks into the room and after the door closes, uh, the uniformed man, he removes the sign from the door to reveal another sign which is stuck to the door, the real sign which has the initials GSC on it, which stand for Gangsters Syndicate of Chicago. So Tintin has entered a room which is occupied by uh, this man, this bespectacled man. He's wearing a blue suit, sitting behind a desk, and he identifies himself as Bobby Smiles. He is the boss of uh, rival gangs that are fighting against Al Capone. So Bobby Smiles is willing to hire Tintin 
for a monthly fee of $2,000 if he agrees to join Smiles in getting rid of Al Capone. Or if Tintin manages to get rid of Al Capone on his own, Smiles is willing to pay him an extra $20,000 for that. So then he offers Tintin a contract to sign, but Tintin he instead he takes, out, uh, takes out his gun and refuses the offer, saying that the reason why he's in Chicago is to stamp out all the gangsters, not just Al Capone. So just as he's threatening to arrest Bobby Smiles, Tintin uh, he falls through a trapdoor the floor, which was opened by a uh, a button that uh, Bobby had pressed with his foot under the, the desk that he's sitting behind. So the room that uh, Tintin has fallen into, it's filling up with smoke. But upon closer inspection, Tintin realizes that it's not smoke, but it's a gas with an odd smell. He tries to cover his mouth um, and his nose with the, the handkerchief, but that doesn't work, and eventually Unfortunately, Tintin, he passes out. And soon after that, uh, the door to the room opens and in walks uh, a man who's wearing a gas mask. And he identifies the gas as uh, a 0 0.X2Z gas. As, uh, he identifies this gas while speaking to another man who is um, named Nick, who is uh, standing outside uh, the room. So the two men, they, they take Tintin and they drive uh, with him to the waterfront of Lake Michigan and they toss Tintin into the lake and he's still knocked out from, from that gas when he's thrown into the water. So uh, just a little geography note for those of you who are not from America. Lake Michigan is one of the five great lakes in America. It's the world's largest lake in terms of area and is shared by four states. It's Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, and Michigan. That's Lake Michigan for you. So the two men, after disposing of Tintin, they return to Bobby Smiles. And instead of welcoming these guys and you know, telling them, yeah, great job, he's pissed off with these guys. And he tells them that they used the wrong gas. What they used, instead of 0.X2Z gas, was a sleeping gas called Z4 or Z4. And by dumping Tintin into the water, they've made sure to wake him up. So Bobby smiles and tells these men to go back and finish the job. So they race back to the waterfront, they search the water, they don't see Tintin until someone appears behind them and tells them to put their hands up and drop their guns. That person, of course, is Tintin. And he's not armed with a gun. Instead, he's, he's got a finger gun pointed at these two guys, but they don't know. They're just looking at the, at the waterfront, being told to put their hands up by someone that they don't see. So he picks up one of the two guns that they dropped and he fires. Uh, one shot into the air and this gets the attention of some police who are nearby. They show up and they arrest Bobby's men. So we move into the next day now. There's a paper boy who is out on the streets of Chicago. You know, he's doing the, the typical thing, extra extra, read all about it. He's uh, sharing the latest news from the copies, the newspapers that he's selling are the Chicago Tribune, which is a, a real newspaper. He's uh, sharing news about Tintin apprehending the, the gangsters yesterday. As for Tintin, he's back in his hotel room. He's sitting in an armchair by an open window uh, reading a newspaper, funny enough, while Snowy is he's sitting next to him. And in a nearby building, you see Bobby smiles and a shooter. They are looking at Tintin from this other building. And Bobby, he points out 
Tintin and Snowy to this shooter and he tells him to kill them both. So the shooter, he fires his, I think it's a Tommy gun from the, the weapon that he's holding. And after the job is done, Bob smiles, pays the shooter, and the shooter leaves. Meanwhile, back in this hotel room, the real Tintin and Snowy, they appear in the room and what had been shot by uh, the shooter turns out to be dummies of Tintin and Snowy. And uh, now that Bobby thinks that Tintin is dead, uh, Tintin has the opportunity to lay out a trap for Bobby Smiles. So we move on to the day after that, it's the next morning. Bobby Smiles, he's, um, he's somewhere else, he's speaking to uh, this unknown man about a group called the Coconut Mob that is going to be transporting a load of whiskey in the afternoon. The whiskey will be hidden in gasoline drums. And upon hearing this, Bobby, his interest has been piqued. He's eager to get hold of that whiskey. And he's confident that uh, it will be to be an easy job for him, to be easy to take that whiskey. So in the afternoon, we see there's a red truck that is traveling down on uh, this country road. This red truck is loaded with gasoline drums. And in the passenger seat of this truck, we see Tintin. He's in disguise. He's uh, wearing a trench coat. He's got a brown cap. He's got a mustache um, as well. And he tells the driver that he has a bad feeling. He has a feeling that they are being expected. And sure enough, down the road, there's uh, this makeshift roadblock that has been laid. And there's someone who's waving the, the, the red truck to stop. So the truck stops by the roadblock. And suddenly, more men appear. And they you know, try to hijack Tintin and the driver. But unknown to the hijackers, Tintin and the driver, they came prepared because out of those gasoline drums, policemen, they appear. And they, they round up the, hij the, the hijackers and, as one of the pol and afterwards, as one of the policemen is thanking Tintin for, for helping them, um, they hear uh, shots being fired. And then they turn to see Bobby Smiles. He's driving away in a getaway, uh, getaway car. So now the policeman is, is upset now because they lost such a big catch. They had Bobby Smiles right there. But he's, he's driving away. But Tintin, he assures the policeman not to worry because he will, he promises to, to apprehend Bobby Smiles. Then we move forward, it's a few days later, Tintin has uh, received a couple of telegrams which indicate that Bobby Smiles has been spotted in a place called Redskin City, which is located near an, an Indian reservation. So that's their next destination. And uh, as for Snowy, he's not too thrilled about heading into Indian territory. Um, it seems like he's, he's got this fear of uh, you know, Native Americans. I don't know why, but you know, that's, that's snowy for you. So they board a train, they head out west, and two days later they walk into Redskin City. As they walk through the streets, uh, Tintin he notes that they, you know, they stand out because everyone else is dressed you know in western fashion dressed like like cowboys while Tintin he's he shows up he looks like he's just some guy who's out on a stroll so then he heads off to a clothing shop to you know get some appropriate clothes the, the same clothes that he's wearing on the cover of Tintin in America that's what he wears now while Snowy is you know he's waiting outside the shop and he meets these uh, two quote-unquote Indian dogs. I say Indian because they've got, um, there's one dog who's got a, a feather 
attached to his uh, to its tail, and another the other dog has got a, a feather on attached to one of its ears. So um, while that's going on, one of Bobby's men has seen that Tintin has arrived in town, and he hurries over to a, a house where Bobby Smiles has been hiding, and he informs Bobby Smiles that Tintin is around, and of course. Bobby is not too pleased about that because he had escaped Tintin days ago, but the guy has uh, caught up to him. So after getting the new threads, Tintin he meets up with a man who is uh, willing to give him a horse. Um, the one, uh, the horse that Tintin is shown is named Beatrice, and what ends up happening is uh, she kicks Tintin. Snowy and uh, that man out of the stable. So uh, Tintin ends up getting another horse and uh, with that uh, new horse, he and uh, Snowy, they head off um, going after, you know, heading towards um, the gangster hideout where Poppy Smiles is. They make it to the hideout and they find that there's nobody there. Tintin, he looks out a window just in time to see someone riding away it's Bobby Smiles so Tintin he gets back on his horse and he chases after Bobby the thing with Tintin you know, while chasing after Bobby he's got uh, a long uh, rope uh, a lasso which um, he's trying to use to catch Bobby um, with but Tintin I don't think he's uh, had enough time to practice, you know, with a lasso. He ends up getting himself tangled with the rope and that horse that he's riding, it's, it throws him off. So, so much for Tintin's plan. As for Bobby, he rides away and eventually he is seen by a group of Native Americans. And upon being seen by uh, these these uh, Native Americans, he, you know, exclaims, you know, sing sing. Now the thing with Bobby is, um, whenever you know he's upset or you know shocked or surprised, he has these exclamations, and this is one of them, which is you know sing sing. Now for those of you who don't know, sing sing is uh, like a nickname of a prison in America. I'll put a link um, in the show notes. So you can learn a bit about Sing Sing, which is funny because Bobby's a gangster and his exclamation happens to be the name of a prison in America. So once he's spotted by uh, these Native Americans, he meets with the chief of the group and he addresses the chief as mighty, I think it's Sachem or Sachem, S-A-C-H-E-M. Hopefully someone can can let me know what's the, pro uh, the proper pronunciation. Um, a sachem or sachem is um, an elected representative who leads a tribe of Native Americans. So he lets the chief know that he comes in peace. And the chief asks Bobby why he's here on the hunting grounds of the Blackfoot Indians, which are based on, on real life um, Native Americans the Blackfeet Nation. I'll put a link to that as well in the show notes. As well, if you're watching the video version, I will also put, you should be seeing now, the, the flag of the Blackfeet Nation, so that you at least know. And uh, Bobby, he explains to the chief that uh, there's, a, there's someone chasing after him who is uh, coming to steal these hunting grounds. And unaware of uh, who Bobby Smiles uh, is, uh, let alone who Tintin is, uh, the chief, he shares this false information with his, with his tribe. And he says that they must, quote, raise the tomahawk against this uh, miserable pale face with the heart of a prairie dog, end quote. Speaking about Tintin. And, uh, you know, this is all thanks to Bobby Smiles. So, unfortunately, now... Uh, Tintin is in trouble with uh, the Blackfeet tribe because of, you know, Bobby Smiles. 
So the chief, he thanks Bobby for the, the warning about Tintin. And then, then he starts digging through the ground in search of a, a tomahawk or a hatchet that they must, you know, they must raise against uh, Tintin. But he can't seem to remember where they buried that hatchet. I guess this is where the, the expression comes from, burying the hatchet. Um, after the, the previous uh, fight that they must have had. And that's not good news for Bobby because if they can't find the tomahawk, they can't, you know, fight against um, Tintin. As for Tintin, uh, he and Snowy, they are on the move again. But because of what happened previously, they wasted a lot of time. And now Tintin, he suggests that they should find a spot where they can camp for the night. They will continue pursuing after Bobby smiles in the morning. Meanwhile, back at the camp of the Blackfeet Indians, Bobby is making his plans, um, uh, figuring out how um, you know he can escape before Tintin shows up in the morning, because he's certain that the tomahawk will be found eventually, and then you know, the big fight will happen. So in the morning, Tintin, he wakes up, he's ready to go. Meanwhile, Bobby, he meets with uh, the chief and he finds, uh, you know, to find out if there's any news concerning the tomahawk. But uh, the chief, he says that uh, they haven't found the tomahawk, so there's no, there's no war against Tintin. So, you know, Bobby is, is angry about this and he starts making his way out of the camp. But suddenly, he trips over something, something that's sticking out of the ground. It's the handle of the tomahawk, you know, the, the, the big tomahawk that they couldn't find the day before. There it is. And the chief, he retrieves the tomahawk, and then he calls for his warriors to gather up and get their horses ready, and they ride off to face Tintin. So, uh, you know, now that the tomahawk has been found, it's wartime now against Tintin. So the Blackfeet eventually find Tintin and, uh, you know, he's surprised to see them uh, and Snowy, of course, being frightened of the, the Native Americans, he's, he's uh, more frightened than surprised and because Tintin is unaware of what's going on, um, you know, he, again, he, he's surprised to see them arrive. But, you know, unfortunately, his horse is taken, he's tied up, and he's led back to the camp while Snowy, being frightened, he, uh, he runs off and he hides, you know, behind a cactus. And after the, the group leaves, he realizes that he left, you know, Tintin, um, he abandoned Tintin to be captured by the Indians. And so, uh, so Snowy, he, he's upset with himself. For, for doing that. So at the camp, Tintin is then tied to a wooden pole and he thinks that this is all part of some kind of custom of uh, these uh, these Indians who have captured him. Um, they are, however, they are astonished because they see that he's not frightened, he's not afraid of what has happened. Uh, he's, they're just surprised to see that he's no, he's, he's calm, he's, he's, he's collected, and then the chief speaks to him, you know, he starts threatening him as if Tintin is an actual, you know, enemy to this tribe who has um, arrived to harm um, the Blackfeet. And Tintin is confused by this, and then it becomes clear to him how serious this is when Tintin hears uh, the chief telling his men to you know, attack Tintin. And it turns out that the pole that he's been tied to is the torture pole. And the next thing you know, a tomahawk is thrown at this pole and it narrowly misses Tintin's head. The, the tomahawk hits, hits a spot just above his head. And now this becomes too much for him and he tries to plead with the chief uh, you know, begging him to release him, 
but the chief refuses to, to hear him out. So then Tintin he notices that there's some resin which he can extract from the pole. Uh, resin, it's uh, some, some substance you know, that's secreted by, by plants, usually to protect themselves against predators like insects. So he extracts some of this resin from the pole and then he collects enough to, you know, form these uh, tiny a projectile that he flings into the chief's face. So then the chief turns and um, he sees that uh, there's this small boy nearby who, um, you know, he's holding a, a slingshot. And the chief thinks it's the boy who, you know, hit him in the face. So now he starts punishing the boy and one of the tribesmen has to one of the tribesmen, he picks up the, the slingshot and at that moment uh, the chief is hit in the face again and um, this is when he, you know, he turns to that tribesman who picked up the slingshot and this is when we find out that the name of the chief is Keen-Eyed Mo and that this other tribesman is named uh, Browsing, Browsing Bison. So now they start arguing because the chief thinks, oh, Browsing Bison is the one who you know, hit him in the face. And then uh, Browsing Bison's brother, Bullseye, um, you know, he shows up seeing that, you know, his brother is uh, being attacked by the chief. And the next thing you know, there's a, there's a big fight now because Bullseye, he hits the chief. So now... There's this big fight going on, you know, the warriors are now fighting amongst each other. And uh, while that's going on, you know, Tintin, he manages to free himself and he escapes from the camp. As for Bobby, who has been waiting in um, one of the TPs, this is uh, a TP is, um, how can I describe it? One of those tent-like structures that um, you may have seen uh, Native Americans, they usually um, um, set up in their, in their areas, that's, that's a TP. So he's there thinking that, you know, with all the, the noise that's going on outside, uh, that's Tintin being tortured. Only for Bobby to step outside and he sees that there's a fight going on and Tintin, he's way out in the distance, far away from the camp. So Bobby, he uh, takes, a, uh, takes a rifle and he starts firing at, at Tintin. Um, as for Tintin, um, he, he looks back, he thinks that all the, the, those shots being fired towards him, they are from the Blackfeet warriors, unaware. But when he looks back, he sees that it's Bobby Smiles who's firing at him. And this is when... Uh, Tintin puts two and two together and he figures out why the Blackfeet was so hostile towards him. Um, Snowy, who um, hears the, the gunshots, he you know, steps out of hiding and uh, you know, he um, heads out. So Tintin, as he's running away from the camp, he's not looking where he's going. And he ends up running off a cliff and into a canyon. And Bobby, he catches up. He looks down into the canyon. And he sees that it's a, you know, it's a very deep canyon. So he assumes that uh, Tintin he may not have survived that fall. So he starts walking away. And then Snowy, he arrives. And, you know, he looks, you know, he looks down the canyon, worried about Tintin. Bobby, he sees Snowy, and he recognizes him as, oh, that's Tintin's dog. So he, you know, starts firing at, at Snowy. And uh, Snowy, he ends up going, you know, over the edge. He, he had been barking into the canyon for Tintin. But with Bobby firing at him, he ends up going over the edge into the canyon. Um, and as he's falling um, into the canyon, he gets caught by this branch of an extending tree um, from um, the you know the sides of the canyon and thanks to this branch 
uh, Snowy is swung onto a ledge um, along the side and this is where Tintin has ended up so he survived that fall and um, um, Tintin he's surprised to see oh Snowy has, has ended up there as well so there they are on this um, on this ledge and at first it looks as if there's no escape for, for the pair but then Snowy he starts sniffing between some rocks behind them and Tintin he uncovers the, a small entrance that they crawl into and they end up in a, in a cave and they crawl um, into this narrow tunnel until they end up um, in a, a much wider room which is decorated with uh, paintings on the cave wall and Tintin wonders if maybe this place might have been a spot which was used by the Blackfeet to hide um, from their enemies so after that he sees another opening which um, he and uh, Snowy they follow back to the surface and they end up um, uh, resurfacing underneath a rock that Bobby smiles he just so happens to be sitting on top of this rock uh, preparing uh, a meal for him to eat after you know getting rid of Tintin but once he sees Tintin um, resurface you know he just runs for his life because he thinks he has, uh, he has seen a ghost but as for Tintin and Snowy they are very much alive so they decide to you know, help themselves to the meal that uh, Bobby had just been preparing as for Bobby he runs all the way back to the Blackfeet uh, camp and he speaks to Chief Keen Eyed Mole tells him that oh he's seen Tintin come back from the dead and so the chief he gathers his men and uh, with Bobby they ride back to the spot where they uh, where, where he found Tintin and uh, Tintin and Snowy while they are there having their meal there are arrows and tomahawks that are thrown at them so they jump back underground um, for safety uh, the chief and his men they follow after Tintin and Snowy underground while Bobby he, you know, he just sits um, and waits for them um, to come back with Tintin but some time passes there's, there's nothing going on until the Blackfeet warriors they resurface they have got good news for, for Bobby Chief Kenai Mo has defeated Tintin and so the men they are you know pulling themselves out of the, the hole and they bring out uh, you know the enemy that they defeated underground that enemy turns out to be one of their own this warrior named lame duck because it turns out they were fighting underground in the dark so the person they thought was Tintin was uh, this unfortunate guy uh, lame duck so you know as you'd expect Bobby is not too happy about this because they failed to get Tintin but the chief has an idea they could just simply leave Tintin to starve underground um, so Bobby although he's not thrilled about you know Tintin not having been dealt with he decides to go along with this idea um, they just, they just go with it so what they do is they push this large rock over the, the hole in the ground and then there's this one warrior who's left stationed on top of this rock so underground uh, Tintin he's got his own um, idea he empties the gunpowder from all his cartridges um, with the idea of uh, blasting away the rocks so that he and Snowy can escape so he sets a charge and then he and Snowy they get to a, a safe spot and wait for the explosion but nothing happens so what's plan B they decide to escape the old-fashioned way which is to dig their way out in the dark so as they start making some progress uh, Tintin notices that the soil has become damp uh, even snowy he makes a comment saying oh, the, the, the soil has got this odd smell to it 
and then suddenly from that hole in the ground um, with the big rock and the warrior that has been placed over it a stream of oil gushes out and this is how Tintin and Snowy they make it back outside um, you know shocked by uh, this sudden stream of oil and it's not long after that that several cars arrive and uh, these businessmen they pour out of these cars one after the other and they are eager to speak to Tintin and they want to they want him to sign away the rights to this newly discovered oil well one guy is offering five thousand dollars another guy offers ten thousand dollars twenty five thousand dollars fifty thousand dollars a hundred thousand dollars you know these are the offers that Tintin is getting but he tells these men that the oil is not his to give away it belongs to the Blackfeet uh, Native Americans and it's when this the the first man the man who offered Tintin five thousand dollars when he hears this his attitude suddenly changes and he goes over to Chief Kenaid Moore and he gives him $25 you know, from offering Tintin $5,000 he gives the chief $25 and tells him uh, to vacate uh, this, this land he has one hour to move the entire Blackfeet tribe off the land um, and the chief as you'd expect he thinks this man is crazy but one hour later the National Guard they arrive and you have soldiers moving the Blackfeet off of the land and then two hours later construction begins three hours later uh, the there's a building that's already taking shape this building is for Cactus and Petroleum Bank Incorporated and the next day the same place which was you know the hunting ground for the Blackfeet has turned into of you know of, of an entire city in just a day to the point where there's already you know there's traffic and everything there's even a, a cop you know who's a traffic cop who's speaking to Tintin in this in this new city you know he's uh, telling Tintin you know he's making you know he's pointing out that Tintin he should he should leave because he's he's uh, he's not wearing you know the appropriate clothing he's still in his his wild west outfit so in just a span of a day from hunting ground to an entire city being being built uh, it's crazy stuff so Tintin and Snowy they you know they are walking through the streets of this new city and Tintin he feels bad because Bobby Smiles once again has gotten away from them so they make it to a, a railway crossing you know still thinking about Bobby Smiles and just as Tintin is wandering um, a train you know just whizzes by and on this train Tintin sees Bobby Smiles so Tintin he hurries over to the station and he speaks to a, a station master to find out when the next train is scheduled to depart and the station master he says that the next train will leave at the same time tomorrow so now it looks like uh, there's, there's, there's no chance, there's no hope for Tintin now until he and Snowy decide to borrow another a train and they chase after the one that Bobby Smiles is on much to the shock of the train uh, the station master and uh, the driver who has just arrived so the station master he telephones one of the engineers who's down the track and he tells him to change tracks uh, so that the, the hijacked train can you know move to, a, to another track and uh, this changing of tracks it happens just as uh, Tintin's train is about to catch up to Bobby's train 
So Tintin now is trying to stop the engine of uh, this train and reverse. But uh, the, the brake lever jams and Tintin realizes that uh, the engine of this train that he borrowed had been undergoing some repairs. So now he is stuck in this uh, runaway train after this, uh, having the brilliant idea of uh, borrowing it. So uh, this train continues along the track and uh, it picks up uh, this, uh, this passenger uh, in the form of uh, an old man who has been trying to cross the, uh, the railway uh, track. He's, uh, he's in this uh, horse-drawn cart. So the train just comes along and uh, picks, you know, destroys that cart and it just picks up the old man. Uh, the horse has been, you know, left behind and he just looks, um, as the train is passing by, he just uh, looks in confusion at, at what has just happened. And then way ahead um, on the track, there are these two men. Um, one of them is named Slim and the other one is named Jim. It is a little nod to Slim Jim, if you know knows what that is. And uh, they have uh, placed a stick of dynamite into uh, this massive boulder that is uh, on the track. They are, um, and, uh, you know, they are they're relieved because, you know, once they get rid of uh, they are they're relieved because getting rid of uh, the boulder today um, would be a good thing because they believe that the train, there's no train that's going to be coming along um, the, tr the track today, unknown to them. And uh, the, suddenly they see Tintin's train coming along the track and next thing you know, that boulder collides with the train and it's blasted away. And at first it seems like, okay, things are okay, the, blow, the, the boulder has been gotten rid of. Until Slim, he reminds Jim that um, uh, along the track there's a trolley which not only contains uh, their work tools, but the extra sticks of dynamite. And that trolley is uh, half a mile down the railway track. And eventually, that trolley meets the train and there's a massive explosion. That's the end of the train. So the train uh, destroyed uh, Tintin. Um, the, the horse uh, car driver, they, they end up in a tree. Snowy, uh, he, he ends up um, under the coal shuttle of the, of the train, but Overall, everyone is okay, despite the massive explosion. So afterwards, Tintin, he speaks to Slim and Jim, and he tells them that he has to leave right away because he is chasing after Bobby Smiles. So afterwards, Tintin and Snowy, they continue on their journey, and this time they are moving through the desert. But Tintin is not worried because uh, Slim and Jim, they gave him some supplies to carry with him, um, you know, through this through this uh, desert. Meanwhile, in a town not too far away, a robbery has taken place at the bank. One of uh, the regular customers is there. He's explaining to a couple of policemen that when he arrived at the bank in the morning, he found the body of the manager and uh, the safe which had been you know, left wide open. So he left the bank, he went to raise the alarm, and although some men were apprehended and were hanged, the chief culprit of this robbery managed to escape. So the policemen, they look around the bank, they find some footprints near a window, and they notice that the footprints uh, belong to someone who's wearing boots and also judging by these uh, footprints the right boot has nails underneath so the policemen they leave the bank following after the footprints the chief culprit of the, the bank robber uh, the bank robbery turns out to be this Mexican man named Pedro and we see him he's walking through a desert 
he's got a, a, a sack full of the, the loot that he got from the bank and he's aware that uh, his footprints are going to give away his location so he starts wondering what he could do about this and eventually he finds Tintin and Snowy who are you know, resting uh, nearby under a cactus and Tintin while he's um, at some point he had taken off his boots and put them just off to the side and this gives Pedro, uh, Pedro an idea he takes Tintin's boots and he leaves, uh, leaves his own boots behind and then later on Tintin and Snowy they wake up at some point they are ready to continue moving and Tintin notices that the boots that are there they are not his boots but well, it doesn't matter they are boots anyway so he just wears them anyway and off they go the policemen who have been following after the footprints they follow them until they reach Tintin and they arrest him um, without nobody having any idea of what had happened before and of course Tintin is confused about the arrest he protests against it the policemen they won't they won't release him because they just think he is the, the bank robber so they, they start asking him about the, the robbery but Tintin doesn't have any idea about this robbery so eventually they lead Tintin and Snowy back to town where there's a lynch mob that is waiting and they just overwhelm the police and they, they take Tintin and Snowy looking to execute them right away so we see um, the, the would-be executioner is you know trying to to hang Tintin and Snowy but when he pulls the rope the rope snaps and uh, the, the, the rest of the mob who are there watching the, the hanging they just laugh at this guy because you know, he has just failed to to hang uh, the, the would-be culprits so elsewhere we see the sheriff is in his office he's uh, you know enjoying some whiskey while listening to radio yeah, there's a, a news report that's going on about the bank robber Pedro Ramirez who has been caught while trying to escape into another state Pedro he confesses to the robbery and this is when the chief, uh, the sheriff when he hears this he realizes that the lynch mob is trying to execute an innocent person so now the sheriff has to go out and you know stop the, the hanging but of course the sheriff he can't leave the, the whiskey behind so he decides well let me just have one more drink before I leave and then that that one drink turns into another and then another and then another and uh, by the time he leaves the office uh, the man can't you know he's stumbling about he can't really walk properly so he ends up passing out you know just under this uh, big signpost outside and this signpost just so happens to have a summarized version of the Volstead Act written on it and guess who signed uh, that little summary of the Volstead Act it was the sheriff now the Volstead Act again please check the show notes for, for links so that you can read more about it the Volstead Act which is known as the National Prohibition Act was an act of the 66th, 66th United States Congress to prohibit intoxicating beverages and to regulate the manufacture production use and sale of high proof spirits for other other than beverage purposes and to ensure an ample supply of alcohol and promote its use in scientific research and in the development of fuel dye and other lawful industries now this act um, was effective from the 28th of October 1919 up until 1933 when the prohibition of alcohol 
was repealed through the ratification of the 21st Amendment. Now it's called the Volstead Act um, because it's named after Andrew Volstead who was a member of the Republican Party and he was uh, a member from Minnesota. He was also uh, a member of the United States House of Representatives. Um, now, he didn't author the, the Volstead Act. Uh, instead, he collaborated with uh, a man named Wayne Wheeler, who was of the Anti-Saloon League. Wayne Wheeler was uh, the person who conceived and drafted the bill. And uh, at the time, Volstead, he was the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee and uh, he helped to get the, the bill passed. So that's um, the Volstead Act in a nutshell. So we go back into town, the hangman, once again, he tries to hang, you know, Tintin and Snowy, but he fails once again. So now the rest of the, the lynch mob, they, they want to try and it turns into a, a big brawl and while that big brawl is happening, Tintin and Snowy, they make their escape. Now some of the, the lynch mob men, they then chase after Tintin and Snowy and one of these men is named Big Jim. So then Tintin and Snowy, they eventually make it to a tree, they hide in that tree and as Big Jim comes along, they ambush Big Jim and then they get on his horse and they ride out of the desert and you know, make it out into a grassy plain where you know, Tintin decides, okay, they should camp out for the night. And then the next day, Tintin, he wakes up to find uh, several wild animals there you know, running away. And uh, he goes on to discover what they're running um, from. Turns out there is a wildfire. And what happened was that the night before, when they camped out, Tintin had uh, left uh, the campfire um, alight. So there's probably a chance that the wildfire might have been caused by that campfire, thanks to Tintin. So Tintin and Snowy, they end up running away also. Uh, eventually they make it to um, you know, this pool of water, escape into the pool, and they swim um, across to the other side. And eventually they make it back onto the road, they leave the prairie, and they find their way back to the railroad. And so Tintin, he suggests that they should follow um, the railroad to the next station and then continue after Bobby smiles from there. So they walk along the railroad until they reach uh, a bend that has a, a sleeper which has been laid across it. Um, a sleeper, basically it's a, it's a cross brace which is used to you know, support rails uh, on a rail track. Or I'll put a link to that in the show notes, get to know what that is. And seeing this uh, sleeper, it puts Tintin on high alert. And at the same time, Snowy he picks up uh, a familiar scent. But before he can do anything about it, um, a rope is thrown and it catches Tintin. This is when Bobby smiles and his associate, Jake, make their appearance. So now that Bob, uh, Tintin has been captured, Bobby he reveals his initial plan and says, yeah, he was planning to wreck the, the train that he, was, he had been boarding earlier on and steal um, $500,000 which had been in the mail coach of that train. But now that uh, he has captured Tintin, Bobby has changed his mind and he'll let uh, the train, let it pass. And uh, uh, instead, you will have Tintin tied to the tracks so that when the train comes along, Tintin will be run over by the train. So Snowy is there, he attacks Bobby, but uh, Jake, he hits Snowy over the head with uh, his pistol. And 
Robbie, he, you know, he just kicks Snowy away. And then after that, the two men, they leave Tintin tied to the rail track. And that train that uh, Bobby had been talking about, it's on its way. And for Tintin, the only thing he can do now, you know, is just lie there on the track. And it looks like this might be the end of him. So on the train, suddenly someone pulls the alarm lever. And uh, this causes the train to come to a halt right next to where Tintin has been tied. The person who pulled uh, the lever turns out to be uh, a woman from the American Association of Animal Admirers. And the reason why she, she pulled this lever is because she saw a puma attacking a deer. And uh, you know this really upset her. So she uh, speaks to the conductor and uh, you know, tells him to do something about that. But as for the conductor, he He's not too amused about uh, this woman suddenly having the train, you know, stopped because of this, uh, uh, this, this so-called reason. So, once that has been cleared up, um, he calls for, you know, the train to, to get started up. But this is when Tintin, you know, he finally shouts for help. And an engineer hears him, steps out of the train, and he goes over to find, oh, there's someone tied to the track. And so, this is how Tintin is rescued. The next day, uh, we see uh, Bobby Smiles is uh, made to another hideout, which is somewhere in the mountains. And he's reading a newspaper, and this is when he finds out about Tintin's miraculous escape. And Bobby, again, not too happy about this, because he had left Tintin tied to the railway track, but somehow he managed to escape. As for Tintin and Snowy, they we see them, they are making their way to the mountains. And Snowy he is following a scent, um, guiding Tintin along, and eventually they see the hideout on a cliff, one of these mountains, and they start climbing towards that hideout. Bobby He's looking out a window, he sees Tintin and Snowy coming along, but he's prepared and he presses a button on a detonator to trigger a rock fall. And then once he, he does that, he you know goes on to pour himself a drink, you know, believing that the rock fall has uh, killed Tintin. And now as he, as just just as Bobby is offering a toast to Tintin. The door to the hideout opens, there's Tintin, very much alive, uh, because he and uh, Snowy, when the rock fall happened, uh, they hid, you know, under a, you know, an overhanging rock um, to avoid the rock fall. So now Bobby, he charges at Tintin with uh, the bottle that uh, he poured his drink from, but Tintin, he's prepared, he's got a gun, he shoots the bottle, and then he goes on to apprehend Bobby. And so three days later, we are back in Chicago at the police station where the chief of police he receives a phone, a phone call from someone who is inquiring about Tintin. But the chief hasn't heard um, anything about Tintin, um, hasn't heard from him as well. And then after the phone call, there's a knock at the door. Another police officer enters the office and he's with a group of delivery men who are uh, bringing in this large crate into the office. And in this crate is Bobby Smiles, you know, gift, gift wrapped, ready for, you know, captured by Tintin. And there he is presented to the police. And so the chief, you know, picks up the phone and uh, he speaks to someone named Chuck to relay the news to the press that Bobby Smiles is now in police custody. So we move on to the next morning where Tintin is heading out um, to the police station. And he tells Snowy to you know, stay behind in the um, hotel room 
while he's, he's away. So outside the hotel room, uh, uh, Tintin is met by a group of representatives who want to um, want to pay him um, all kinds of money. Um, you have one representative from the World of Vol uh, Vaudeville Incorporated who's willing to pay uh, Tintin um, one thousand dollars a week, um, you know, for his services. He offers uh, Tintin a check for five thousand dollars up front to cover expenses. Um, another representative from uh, Pantechnicon Radio. Uh, Pantechnicon is a, it's a type of van. He offers Tintin two thousand dollars weekly um, for Tintin to deliver what's called fireside chats um, every week. Uh, fireside uh, chats, these are based on the real life fireside chats. These were a series of nightly radio addresses which were given by um, US President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This was between 1933 and 1944. Fireside chats. And uh, then there's another representative from a dog food company who has uh, $10,000 um, for Snowy, if he can be the face of their uh, their brand, uh, Bonzo Bigs. Um, another representative is willing to you know um, pay Tintin if he can feature in one of their latest movies. And then of course the final representative is from uh, you know a new religion, um, willing to pay Tintin if you know he joins this new religion the neo judeo buddho islamo islamo americanism this new religion but tintin of course he's not having any of this and he hurries back into the hotel room where he finds that tintin uh, snowy is missing now and in his place there's a note that has been stuck to the chair where snowy had been sitting and this is what the note says if you want to see your dog again, alive, the price is $50,000. If you agree to put a white handkerchief in, in your window, otherwise. So now, Tintin, he hurries over to uh, the phone and he calls reception to report what has happened. What has happened? He tells them not to let anyone leave the hotel and is then informed that uh, there is a hotel detective available. So, okay, that's some some news for Tintin. He, you know, he's now pacing around the hotel while waiting for this uh, hotel de uh, detective to show up. But as he's pacing around, he doesn't know what to do because, on one hand, he does not want to comply with whoever left the note. But on the other hand, he is worried that you know, if he doesn't do anything, Snowy could be, you know, could be killed. So then afterwards, there's a knock at the door and a man walks in. This uh, sharply dressed man is in a brown suit. He's wearing a black bowler hat. And uh, this is the hotel detective. He's named Mike McAdam. You know, this, uh, Mike McAdam, just judging from his dialogue, he comes off as one of these characters who talks uh, super fast. Um, so he speaks to Tintin and uh, you know, he's very sure of his uh, detecting skills and uh, he gets right down to you know breaking things down for, for Tintin. So this is what he says to him. Right, here's the picture. The dog's asleep, someone comes in, Chloroforms the pooch, puts him in a sack. The kidnapper is 33 and 6 weeks old. Speaks English with an Eskimo accent, smokes paper dollar cigarettes, wears an undershirt and has matching garters. Easily identified by a tattoo mark on his left shoulder blade. The kidnapper has a slight limp with his right foot, cut himself trimming a corn the day before yesterday. And one more detail, snores in his sleep. I tell you sir, his grandfather was scalped by the Sioux 40 years ago 
and he has a profound dislike for bird's nest soup. You know everything I've spotted, you know everything I've spotted from a quick look around. I just just tried to you know, speak really fast like uh, what I think Mike, Mike, uh, Mike McAdam would sound. But that's, that's what he says to Tintin. Just as soon as he walked in, he immediately tells him, okay, yeah, this is what happened. So um, I just mentioned there, it's spoken about uh, the kidnapper's grandfather being scalped by the Sioux. The Sioux, um, this is S-I-O-U-X. Um, this is uh, the name which represents a group, uh, groups I should say, of uh, Native American tribes and First Nations people. Um, in North America, um, consisting of the Dakota and Dakota. Um, there will be a link to that in the show notes. So back to uh, Mr. McAdam. He tells Tintin that he will return with Snowy within the hour, and then he leaves. So, you know, Tintin is just amazed by uh, this guy and his skills, uh, because, like I said, as soon as he arrived, he just tells Tintin, he just tells him, okay, this is what happened. So then, an hour later, McAdam, he returns, and he returns with a dog, but it's not Snowy, it's uh, some other dog, and uh, you know, the owner of the dog also appears, this angry woman, and she's not too happy about uh, Mike having taken a dog, so she hits him over the head um, with her umbrella. So afterwards, Tintin has to you know, help Mike back on his feet, and uh, you know he's noting that the woman, you know, didn't hold back when she hit him over the head. So now uh, Mike, you know, he doesn't believe that uh, you know a woman hit him over the head. Uh, you know, he believes that uh, instead he was just hit by um, some other guy who. Um, at a club, and you know, again, he, you know, deduces what what happens to him. You know, telling him that the attacker, so hit me over the head with a Japanese club. It was a man, 22 years old, with two back teeth missing, wearing rubber-soled shoes, and as a regular and is a regular reader of the Saturday Evening Post. And Tintin, upon hearing this, he asks him if he's sure, and uh, McAdam is certain, and he leaves again. Again, he says he'll bring Snowy back um, within one hour. But instead of one hour, several hours pass. And when McAdam returns this time, instead of one dog, he has brought with him 17 dogs, each of them a different uh, breed. And it's at this point where Tintin has had enough uh, with uh, McAdam's services, so he kindly escorts him out, and he says he'll continue this case alone. So later on, uh, an unknown man on the streets of Chicago, he sees a white handkerchief in the window of Tintin's hotel room. The man then goes on to buy several newspapers from a paper boy and he checks the papers for any news about Tintin but there's no news and to the man this means that Tintin has not called the police yet but unknown to the man the paper boy is Tintin in disguise so he follows the man to a speakeasy called the Moonshine Club uh, speakeasy is a bar that sold alcoholic beverages during the prohibition era that's from 1920 to 1933 and he watches uh, the man speak uh, to another gangster named Bugsy and uh, the two agree to meet up later and then Bugsy leaves so Tintin follows Bugsy to an apartment building and as he wonders which uh, apartment Snowy could be in, Tintin hears a uh, howling coming from a room on the 8th floor. So we see Tintin racing up the stairs, enters the room, and finds a mother 
holding um, a wailing baby that was the source of the howling. So after that, Tintin exits the building and he waits for Bugsy to leave as well. Eventually, Bugsy leaves and uh, he's carrying a large parcel that Tintin believes is snowy. And this time, Tintin he decides to run ahead and uh, he goes around the block to anticipate Bugsy from a corner. And uh, Tintin he finds a stick which he plans to hit Bugsy over the head with. But instead of catching Bugsy, Tintin accidentally hits a policeman over the head. And uh, then uh, Tintin, realizing what he has just done, he flees the scene, unaware that the policeman has spotted him. And he takes out a gun, he fires at a prop sword that is hanging um, by a chain over the sign of a, an armorer called uh, the Sword of Damocles. And uh, this prop sword, it falls on Tintin, knocking him out. And the next time he wakes up, uh, he's sharing a jail cell with a few other individuals. Um, and he's there thinking about Snowy. The Sword of Damocles, maybe you've heard uh, this, heard of this. Uh, Damocles uh, was a, a character from an, uh, an anecdote about um, the ever-present danger that exists for people who are in a position of power. Um, this is represented by a sword hanging over um, the throne where that person would be you know, sitting metaphorically, the sword of Damocles. So I guess it uh, you know, just made a little sense there. Um, at some point, uh, the policeman who you know, arrested Tintin, he arrives at the cell to escort Tintin to the chief of the police. When the chief finds out who Tintin is, he starts apologizing to him and lets him go free. And uh, that's the good news for Tintin. The bad news, though, is that Tintin has now lost track of Bugsy. So he returns to the corner where he accidentally hit the policeman. And thinking that maybe Bugsy could have gone in the, the direction beyond the corner, Tintin follows um, um, after Bugsy, until he meets another policeman and asks him if he saw Bugsy not too long ago. The policeman says he did see Bugsy and says he got into a red sedan that had been waiting for him at another corner and he drove off in the direction of Silvermount. Uh, I'm not sure if Silvermount is a, a real life place in America. I tried to look up um, for this maybe, but I didn't find anything. If anyone knows, um, you can let me know. So Tintin, he walks in that direction. He is passing um, you know, a, a number of uh, brand signs, a lot of cars, uh, you know, the remains of uh, cars that have been just left off the side of the road. So uh, these signs, he finds uh, there's night brand cans, there's Wrigley and there's Coca-Cola. Um, Coca-Cola, I think you know what Coca-Cola is. But Wrigley, of course, uh, initially when I saw this, I thought maybe it might be a reference to Wrigley Field. Um, this is a, a major baseball stadium in Chicago, which would have made a lot of sense. But it turns out there's a, this particular reference is a Wrigley, the Wrigley Company, which is the world's largest manufacturer of chewing gum. Um, upon reading a little bit about Wrigley, um, the owner, he bought the, the stadium. I'm trying to remember what, I think the, the initial name for the stadium was Cubs Park. And then eventually the name would be changed to Wrigley Field. So that's that's the little reference there. So um, Tintin, as he's passing these, these signs, he eventually um, makes it outside the gates of a, a big house 
and from this house that uh, red sedan is just driven out so in a room of uh, this house we see Bugsy and the man uh, who met him at the moonshine club they are listening to another man um, this bald man who's wearing glasses who is in charge of their kidnapping operation and he proposes that they should go legit and advertise their business as kidnapping incorporated yeah I don't know how far that will go but there it is kidnap incorporated he then leaves the room to get the bylaws of uh, the company from another room and so while the, the, the two uh, gangsters are waiting for their boss they hear the boss give a loud shout so they hurry out of the room they enter the other room and they find the boss is is on the floor so Bugsy tells uh, the other man to go get some water because he thinks maybe the boss has had a stroke so the other man runs out of the room and then while he's outside he hears Bugsy uh, give a shout so he runs back into the room and he finds that Bugsy he too is on the floor knocked out and so just as this man is you know trying to find out what's going on um, he is hit over the head um, by the hilt of a sword that a suit of armor behind him is carrying in that suit of armor is Tintin so with those three men knocked out cold he leaves the room and he makes his way to a stairwell and at the bottom of this stairwell is a tunnel that leads Tintin to three holding cells each with a sign above the door indicating which prisoner is inside the first cell has good news he's a senator he was kidnapped on the 20th of, of June and is being held for a ransom of a hundred thousand dollars second room he is occupied by MRC sword general who was kidnapped on the 18th of May and is being held for a ransom of a hundred thousand dollars and then the third room is occupied by Snowy who was kidnapped on the 25th of June and is being held for a ransom of fifty thousand dollars so Tintin knocks on the third cell he hears uh, Snowy howling from inside and he assures Snowy that he'll release him soon so uh, Tintin he he needs to get the, the cell keys so he returns upstairs just in time to see the boss um, has woken up he's unaware why he suddenly has a headache after you know he just had a glass of, of whiskey but Tintin as soon as he enters the room he knocks out the boss um, and then gets the uh, gets the keys and then returns to the cells so after Snowy has been rescued, um, Tintin hears a whistle coming from upstairs and guesses that it could be the alarm sounded by one of the gangsters. Upstairs we see that the boss is awake and he has rounded up a group of thugs. And he gives them 10 minutes to find Tintin and bring him back. Meanwhile back in the back downstairs, Tintin and Snowy they leave the cell and they make their way to two other doors one door leads to the dungeons and the other door leads to the keep then we see the thugs they arrive uh, downstairs and they reach those same doors and they find that the door to the keep is open so they head inside thinking that Tintin has gone in and trapped himself in the keep but unknown to them the signs above the doors were switched so they instead ran into the dungeons so Tintin and Snowy they emerge from the real keep and they lock the thugs inside the dungeons meanwhile the boss upstairs he is in the meeting room waiting for the group which has been gone for half an hour now and uh, you know he hasn't heard from them he's wondering what's going on this is odd Tintin he arrives and he tells the boss put 
raised his hands up, pointing a gun at him. And the boss, of course, is surprised to see Tintin, but he puts his hands up. And uh, Tintin, um, before he can do anything else, the boss makes his escape because uh, via a trap door, because he, you know, he pushed a button uh, near the de near the the desk where he's been he's been sitting. So the next morning, uh, the boss he hears a report on the radio about Tintin's efforts, um, which um, has led to the arrest of uh, those men that he had sent after him. So now the police are focused on lo uh, locating the head of this kidnapping syndicate. And uh, you know the boss, you know he's uh, listening to this. He just laughs because he still has a plan. He picks up the phone and he calls an associate of his named Maurice and asks him if he's still working for um, cannery called Grind. The following morning. Tintin receives an invitation from Grind, um, which is um, asking him to, uh, to visit their new plant. Uh, of course, he's intrigued by uh, this invitation, but he accepts. So then, Tintin and Snowy, they go to the plant and are given a tour by uh, a manager. Um, they are shown, you know, scrap uh, car, uh, car parts. Uh, that were sent to Grind by uh, automobile plants, which Grind then turns into cans for corned beef. As for the, the old cans that they have, they then send them to the automobile plants, which they use to manufacture cars. Uh, and were well, then shown in a conveyor belt, which is a, a cow being moved along into a machine that uh, processes the cows into various meat products, corned beef, sausages, uh, and cooking fat. So then after that, Tintin, Snowy, and the manager, um, they move up, um, up a ladder onto a walkway, which is above uh, the machine, just to watch how it works. And we see Tintin and Snowy, they are leaning on one of the railings looking down into the machine's grinders when uh, that section of railing breaks off and they fall into the machine and the manager who's still on the walkway you know he just just laughs as he's walking away and uh, he goes off to phone the boss who is pleased to hear from maurice that tintin has been dealt with so uh, while uh, Maurice is you know, gloating over what has happened to Tintin, he's uh, back walking uh, about on the plan, in the plant, and uh, he finds two employees who are just sitting about. And he asks them why they aren't working. Um, and they explain to him that uh, they, they stopped the machines, um, and it's because a strike is going on. Um, the employers of plant they have cut down the workers pay that they receive for quote bringing in the dogs and cats and rats they use to make salami end quote so uh, the next time you're at the supermarket and you see uh, some salami on the shelf maybe you might want to think about what's in that salami so maurice now he starts panicking and uh, he's worried about, you know, what uh, what would happen if the boss were to find out about the strike that's going on. But uh, as for Tintin and Snowy, because the machines were stopped, they crawl out of the processing machine unarmed, safe, because the machines were stopped before the, you know, they uh, got ground up. So Maurice, he hurries over, he finds them, and uh, you know he starts apologizing to Tintin for a so-called accident. Uh, Tintin, he returns to his car with Snowy, and you know while sitting in the car, he, you know he voices his uh, suspicions about what's been going on, you know because first he got uh, this uh, invitation to the plant, and then there's the behavior of the manager, and then there's. Uh, 
this accident that happened to him. It's all very, very shady. Meanwhile, Maurice now, he has to phone the boss and tell him what has happened. And also explain to him that Tintin hasn't been dealt with. He is still alive. And uh, the boss is not pleased. And he, he scolds Maurice for not getting the job done. Uh, Tintin and Snowy, uh, they made their way back um, into the plant. They got to uh, Maurice's office there. They're outside and they overhear him speaking with the boss. So Maurice, he tries to plead with the boss, but um, he ends up getting uh, the phone hung up on him. So he leaves the office and uh, you know he's aware now that he's in serious trouble. The boss, later on, he gets a, a phone call. I mean, well, soon afterwards, he gets a phone call from Maurice with some good news for him. And uh, the boss, he leaves going um, for the offer to the plant. Once he arrives at the plant, he is directed to Maurice's office by Tintin, who is uh, uh, disguised as a doorman. And when the boss uh, enters the office and speaks to Maurice, he finds out that Tintin, in fact, did not phone him earlier. So now the boss is furious. He knocks out Maurice with his cane. Uh, Tintin enters the office and surprises the boss. But the boss, he's prepared. His cane uh, turns out to have a concealed blade. So now there's a brief fight between him and Tintin. And we see Tintin, he avoids being cut or stabbed. He ends up um, getting onto the office desk. Then he jumps up and he's swimming from the, the big office light, which he then brings crashing down onto the boss, onto the boss, knocking him out. And then both he and Maurice are tied up and uh, Tintin and Snowy they make it out of the plant with uh, two gangsters apprehended. So later on, after this, there's a large gathering that takes place somewhere. And uh, this gathering is uh, being led by a representative of the Central Committee of the Distressed Gangsters Association, the CCDGA. Can you believe it? Uh, it's an association for gangsters. So this is what he says to the uh, people who have gathered. Yes, gentlemen, our whole profession is on the verge of ruin. In a matter of weeks, two of our most important executives and many of their dedicated aides have paid with their freedom for this valor, for the valor with which they attacked the enemy. Gentlemen, this cannot go on. Soon it will be as hazardous for us to stay in business as to live as honest citizens. On behalf of the Central Committee of the Distressed Gangsters Association, I protest against this unfair discrimination. Forget your private feuds. Stand shoulder to shoulder against the, this mischief-making reporter. Unite against the common enemy and swear to take no rest until this wicked news hound is six feet under the ground. I thank you. I think the only thing that's missing from that was, you know, some background music, because this just sounded like, you would think he's addressing a, you know, a, a labor rally or something, but no, he's addressing some other gangsters as if, um, you know, they're honest citizens. So while that's, gathering is going on. Tintin and Snowy are at another gathering, um, which is um, in the form of uh, an official dinner where Tintin is being honored for his work against the Chicago gangsters. Uh, Snowy is there, but he's not enjoying his time um, because he finds uh, stuff like this you know, very boring. Um, and at the same time, he's got some hiccups. So, uh, wonder how he got those. Uh, as Tintin is telling the, the other guests how he will you know, cherish his memories of America, someone pulls down the main power switch and the lights go out. In the dark is a struggle 
um, someone screams and when the lights are turned back on, Tintin is missing. So the host of the dinner contacts the police and asks for their best detective. As soon as you heard me say that, you should already know which detective was sent. And sure enough, it's Mike McAdam. He shows up and with the help of Snowy, he says he will be back with Tintin within the hour. So while out in the woods, McAdam, he expresses his unease, you know, being in the dark, while uh, Snowy is, you know, leading him along, following his nose. McAdam, he decides to stop and, uh, you know, light his cigar and try to encourage himself, you know, not to be um, too worried about being in the dark. Uh, meanwhile, Snowy, he has picked up an odd scent. And just then, an arm appears from a nearby bush, pulling both Mike and Snowy into the bushes. And you see Snowy, he ends up uh, thrown down into a cellar, where he finds Tintin. He's alive and well, but he's been tied up. And they are then soon joined by the leader of the, you know, the Gangsters Association and uh, his uh, henchman, Sam. And uh, Sam has uh, brought in uh, this big dumbbell that is then chained to Tintin's ankle. And then a trap door is opened and the leader tells Tintin that uh, below is Lake Michigan. He will have to try and swim his way out of this predicament. And then after that, Tintin and Snowy, they are thrown into the water. And then soon afterwards, the leader um, has someone type up a report for the members of the association, announcing that Tintin has been taken care of. So from that scene, we move on to another scene where there's a show taking place somewhere. The great Billy Bolivar is about to show off his strength of uh, lift, uh, lifting a dumbbell with uh, one hand. So he tries to pick up this dumbbell once, but the dumbbell won't budge. So then he tries with two hands, still the dumbbell won't budge. And now the promoter who had just introduced uh, Billy is getting upset now because Billy is not lifting this dumbbell. Only for Billy to explain to him that someone has switched his wooden dumbbell with a real one. So we shift over back to Lake Michigan where we see Tintin is uh, floating on the surface of the water surprised uh, with Snowy because the dumbbell that he's been chained to is floating, you know, uh, surprisingly light, so they don't understand what's going on. And then eventually they uh, are spotted by a police boat and they're rescued. And so Tintin on the boat, he, you know, tells one of the policemen what happened and he urges them to hurry to the gangster's to the gangster's hideout. He knows where it's located. But the policeman turns out to be, surprise, surprise, another gangster. And he says he belongs to the crew that dumped Tintin into the lake. And so just as the gangster pulls out a gun, Snowy bites him in the leg, and Tintin he fights off the other fake policeman. And then he breaks the wooden dumbbell uh, in two and he uses it as a weapon to knock out uh, the first fake policeman. And then when the other um, gangsters were on the boat, they come running along, Tintin, he was with them. And so afterwards, Tintin and Snowy, they go on to find the remaining gangster who is driving the boat. And uh, just to make sure he doesn't try anything, he he still got the um, one half of the broken dumbbell with him. And uh, the, the driver seeing, uh, you know, Tintin casually holding this dumbbell, he thinks, you know, maybe Tintin is, uh, you know, Bo uh, Billy Bolivar, thinking that, oh, he's strong enough to break a dumbbell into not knowing the, the, the real story. So to close out the, the book, there's a report that goes out on the radio 
about Tintin's exploits, helping the police round up members of the Central Syndicate of Chicago Gangsters and kick off a major cleanup operation in Chicago. So then we see on the city streets there's a ticker tape parade going on to celebrate Tintin Snowy before they get on a boat um, um, sailing back to Europe. And the last shot of Tintin that we see is uh, looking over at the Manhattan uh, skyline. Nice way of ending this book of Tintin in America. So there we are. That was book three. Hoping to find out what you thought of this book. As you can tell, it was a fast-paced book. There was a lot of action in it to the point where I thought I think the one thing that was missing for this book was a nice um, soundtrack from the 30s to go along with this with this book. It wasn't boring at all. I think if you just give yourself maybe an hour or two, sit down and read this book, I think you'll enjoy it compared to the other two adventures that uh, Tintin had gone um, on. This one was really um, an improvement from those previous adventures. So now let's get into the notes and uh, trivia for Tintin uh, in America. So like I had said um, at the beginning, Hergé had wanted Tintin's first story to be set in America. This is because when Hergé was, was, was younger, he, he was a Boy Scout and he admired the Native Americans. So that first story would have been about Tintin meeting some Native Americans and going on an adventure with them. But his boss, um, the man who was uh, editor-in-chief of the newspaper that Hergé was working for, the 20th century. This is uh, Abbe Norbert Walls. I'm not sure if that's how his last name is pronounced, but Norbert Walls, he had other ideas and it suggested that uh, for the first adventure Tintin should instead go to Soviet Russia, you know, because they needed to teach the young readers of uh, Tintin about communism, you know, try and dissuade them against against that, you know, just sprinkling in some some propaganda for the children. So the first book ended up being Tintin in the land of the Soviets. Then book two was Tintin in Belgian Congo because again, um, Norbert Walls wanted to, um, you know, propagandize the children telling them you know about the virtues of colonization you know telling them why you know uh, Belgian Congo is such a great place and uh, if I remember correctly around that time the king of Belgium I think he had either visited Congo or was about to visit Congo I'm thinking maybe he, I think he had visited Congo before so this second book had to link up with that visit into, uh, to the Bel uh, Belgian Congo. So that's how we ended up with Tintin in the Congo for book two. But book three, finally, we get Tintin going to America, but with some strings attached, of course, because Norbert Walls had his influence on this book. And the idea for this book had been to criticize America's capitalism, um, America's consumerism, um, you know, mechanization, you know, they didn't want that, that which was happening in America to happen in, in Europe, in Belgium specifically. So that was the point of this book and that's what we got in this book. You know, for example, what happened to the, the Blackfeet Indians being pushed off of their land and then their territory being turned into a city in 24 hours. It was, that was just to point out, you know, America's uh, rapid mechanization. And then the idea of, you know, consumerism and capitalism 
again when Tintin was approached after the discovery of the oil well. That was just an example of you know capitalism, where he, as soon as he had made it back on the surface, um, those men arrived on the scene. You know, not even five minutes after Tintin and Snow had made, had made it, they arrive and already they are offering him all kinds of money just for him to sign away his rights to the oil well. And of course, he you know, explained to them that it didn't belong to him. So, yeah, that was the, the whole point of this book. Hergé had wanted it to also be a vehicle for him to, you know, show the plight of the Native Americans, but unfortunately that didn't really happen because the Blackfeet didn't get that much focus. You know, it was just there for a portion of the book. It wasn't the um, centerpiece of the story. Instead, it was just a story of Tintin going after the Chicago gangsters. And the thing is, Hergé had intended to um, write another adventure which would be um, Tintin going back to America and uh, focusing on the Native Americans. But what ended up happening was instead of Tintin going back to America, Tintin would instead go to Tibet. That book, Tintin in Tibet. That's the story Hergé ended up writing. This was in the late 50s. And that book, Tintin in Tibet, would go on to be one of his best books. Um, unfortunately, we are still many, many books um, away from covering that one because this is book three, Tintin in America. Tintin in Tibet is book 20. So we're still very far from covering that book, unfortunately. So, as far as research goes for Tintin in America, there are three uh, publications that uh, Hergé um, had some, um, he took his sources from. Um, the first book that we'll look at is called Customs and History of the Indian Redskins. That's the English title. This book was written by Rene Evanin or Evanin and Paul Cozy uh, or Cozy at C O Z E or Z E. This was uh, published in Paris and released in 1929. I managed to find a copy of this book in the Internet Archive, so I'll put a link to it in the in the show notes. It's in uh, it's in French, I believe. So if you're not French speaking or can't read French, unfortunately it won't help. But if you can read French, the link will be there so you can have a look at the book. And it's from this book um, where he learned how to you know, draw the, the, the dressing of the, the, Blackfeet, in the Blackfeet Native Americans. The, the clothing they wore, the, the headdresses that they wore, uh, thanks to the illustrations that he found in this book. And um, another book that I would recommend um, where I'm getting my information about Tintin, even for the other two books that we looked at. It's a book called The Complete Companion. And this was written by Michael Farr. So luckily, there's a copy of this book again in the Internet Archive. If the book is not available in your, in your country, you can head over to the Internet Archive and, and read that. So according to the co Complete Companion, Hergé had been in contact with a Belgian priest who was named Father Gaul, and uh, he helped Hergé with um, knowledge about Native Americans, um, with information about their culture, their traditions, and uh, this led to Father Gaul giving Hergé a letter of recommendation from a Native American woman that he had known. And in 1971, Hergé and his second wife, his current widow, Fanny 
Rodwell. They got the chance to travel to America and they were welcomed at an Indian reservation which is in a place called Pine Ridge which is in... I'm trying to find the information here. Uh, Pine Ridge, which is in uh, Dakota, and this was a territory of the the Oglala Sioux, and this is where they met a, um, a Native American by the name of Edgar Red Cloud, who was the great grandson of this famous warrior named Red Cloud, and uh, so you know, Roger was lucky enough to meet um, you know the Native Americans. That was you know, lucky for him. So then um, his second uh, research source was a 1930 book which was uh, called Scenes from Future Life which was written by um, George Duhamel. Um, I tried searching for the book in the Internet Archive. Maybe I was just unlucky enough not to find it. It's probably there but I didn't, maybe I didn't search properly. If anyone finds it in the archive, please um, contact me so that I can add the link into the show notes for people to, to check out. So uh, this book, it was written after the 1929 Wall Street crash. And the point of this book was to strongly criticize America's increased mechanization. And of course, it uh, took up the stance of being against you know, consumerism, modernization, and standardization, which was happening in America at the time. And, like, for, uh, funny enough, this resonated with um, Walls' views, and Hergé, um, at the time, he wasn't really in favor of, you know, rampant capitalism. So, this book really um, helped with that. Um, the third um, research source, it was a magazine, which was the English, the, the English title for this magazine is The Mortal Shell. And it had a uh, special edition, which was centered around America. And this um, edition came out in October of 1930. And uh, it featured articles which were written by a reporter named Claude Blanchard who had visited the United States around that time. And in this article, it included photographs um, of, you know, skyscrapers, e.g., for example, the building that Tintin had crossed from one window to the next, as well as uh, photos of the Ford factories. And it's from these photos that um, Hergé, um, he was inspired to draw the grind corp plant. So some some extra notes as well. Um, in 1973, um, there was an edition of Tintin in America, which was released um, for the American audience. But um, the American publishers had tried to persuade Hergé um, to do some changes. And one of these changes was to edit out um, black characters who had been shown alongside uh, white characters because the, I guess the publishers did not want the, you know, the young readers um, to not see any indication of integration. Which is funny because now you fast forward to 2023, people can't shut up about you know, so-called inclusion and diversity. So I would imagine if Tintin in America had been published now, there would have been plenty of, you know, black characters, um, characters of other races, and maybe some LGBT representation, because of course you got to have representation for everyone. So unfortunately, Hergé uh, he complied with uh, um, this persuasion. So, in the colored version um, of Tintin in America, the 1940, that 1973 edition, one example of um, an edit that had been done, um, 
that bank which had been set up after the Blackfeet had been moved off of their territory. In the original black and white version, the doorman of that bank was white, was black actually. But in the revised version, uh, the doorman was replaced by a white character. And also another interesting edit that was mentioned when Tintin heard, um, you know, howling in the apartment that Bugsy had gone into, when he ran into uh, one of the apartment um, rooms, the woman that he finds, that had been a black woman originally, but in the revised version, it was a white woman. So those are the, I just thought that was interesting to, to, to note. So as well, we talked about the pacing of the story and a lot of the scenes that had been depicted, you know, like the car chases. Again, we mentioned, you know, Tintin on the side of the, the tall building. A lot of that was because Jay had been taking an interest in American cinema, which had been, you know, getting better and better over the years. So that's one of the, the influence of cinema at the time is the reason why we got a lot of these scenes and the pace of the, the story in Tintin in America. So again, I would recommend you check this out. I guess, you know, hindsight being 2020, maybe it was a good thing that Hergé's first story wasn't Tintin in America because by the time he got to writing um, Tintin in America, he had started, you know, doing research and his storytelling had, you know, gotten a bit better. I imagine if he had started book one with Tintin going to America, we might not have gotten a story which is as, as interesting and as, as fun to read. So I guess it's a good thing that book that um, you waited a little bit before getting the chance to write Tintin in America. So yes, we've gotten through the first three books of Tintin and oh, I, I have to say we went from you know, the craziness of Tintin in the Soviet, um, in the land of the Soviets and then the pseudo safari adventure that was Tintin in um, in the Congo. Uh, I don't think <laughs> Any animal rights activists would like that story. And then we get this book as well, Tintin in America. The next book, book four, is called Cigars of the Pharaohs. And this should be a really um, exciting book because we get two uh, major characters being introduced in this book. So I hope you're looking forward to that one. I don't want to um, give away any spoilers, just hold on for that book. In fact, um, a character who is featured in Cigars of the Pharaohs, um, he was given a little um, cameo, I guess a little introduction in uh, Tintin in America. If you go back to the, the scene where Tintin is addressing the guests at the dinner, one of those guests um, listening to Tintin speak is a character who will be properly introduced in Cigars of the Pharaohs. So we'll find out who that is once we get into that book. And also, little trivia note, in uh, the early 90s, there was the cartoon, The Adventures of Tintin, the cartoon adaptation. It's one of the many adaptations for, for Tintin. This uh, cartoon, I think it was the the best one because it tried to be faithful to the, the comics and it's thanks to this cartoon that I learned about about Tintin before I knew about the comics and if anyone is curious the, the little intro that you hear at the, the start of the episodes even the the, the same um, intro that I use for the ending that is the intro theme for the cartoon of the, the early 90s and uh, Tintin in America 
was adapted for an episode of that cartoon. If I manage to find that episode and episodes of you know later books of Tintin, I'll put a link to it in the show notes so you can have a chance to go back and and watch the episode. They were a lot of changes despite the cartoon being you know faithful as best as it's as it's tried to there were a lot of changes that were done um in that episode for tintin in america one change that i made a note of was bobby smiles instead of being you know the boss of a rival gang in the episode he was a henchman so unfortunately uh for Bobby Smiles. So, uh, if you find the episode, please check the show notes and you can have a watch of that episode. So, yeah, we've come to the end of this episode. I hope you you liked Tintin in America. If you're unable to get a copy of Tintin in America, I will put a link in the show notes as well for the Internet Archive where you can have a look at Tintin in America and let me know what you think of, of the book. You can leave a comment um, at my blog site, leave a comment um, in the post for this episode or you can contact me by, by email as well. Be happy to find out from you what you thought of Tintin of America. Was it your favorite adventure out of all the books or was it an adventure you maybe you read? It wasn't really one of your favorites, but maybe after reading it again, after all these years, maybe you've had some second thoughts about it. So please get in touch. Let me know what you think. So now I get the chance to bring you up to speed about what had happened. For those of you who had been unaware, maybe you're not following the other content that I put out, so you might not have been aware of what had happened, why we moved in November last year. What had happened was uh, the landlord where we were staying before, he passed away. And so his brother had um, stepped up and taken, was in charge now. And the arrangements that were made with the, the landlord they unfortunately they did not work out with uh, his brother so we ended up having to leave um, without any um, notice in advance because usually you're given at least three months advance notice but this guy he just wanted us to leave um, as soon as possible so that first week of november we ended up moving out we you know, it was such a, a rush job because the people who had been found to move into that place, they were now there and they were moving their um, their stuff into the house and we, you know, rushing to get our stuff out of the house. And at that time, the, the rainy season had started, so we had to deal with the weather as well. So it was really not a great time to be moving but we eventually moved out. And so we got to this new place which has its own host of problems. And it's been months of, you know, just trying to adjust to this new place because of, unfortunately this place, uh, load shedding, power cuts are very common where, you know, maybe in a week you might have, you know, maybe five days without power and water as well water gets cut it might be cut one day and maybe it comes back several days later initially when we moved in there was a, a schedule that we could follow but as time went on the, the schedule was no longer being followed so you just have to just sit and wait until water comes along and you fill up as many containers as you can because you never know water might be gone the next day. So yeah, that's, that's what's been going on here. And, you know, adjusting to this new place, it also affected 
my you know content creating activities and it uh, you know reached a point where I had to figure out what was the best day to record because at the other place there was a shed and that's where I could do my recordings without you know worrying about disturbing anyone in the house this place there's not much of a shed so I do my recordings on Sunday mornings because this is when everyone else has gone to church so I usually just you know, stay behind, look after the house and that's when I get to do my recordings on, on Sunday mornings. But because of power cuts as well, you can't really be too sure about Sunday mornings. Which is why I decided to start putting my notes in the counter book. You might have heard me you know, turning the pages as I was reading it's from the counter book. This was just in case today, in fact it's not a Sunday morning today, I was just lucky enough to record today, it's, a, it's actually Thursday afternoon. So I was just, I made sure to get all my notes done and get to, to record today. So initially this should have come out in November like I was saying, but things happened. And then this year again because of power cuts, not just because of load shedding, but random faults and also a case of um, power cables being stolen yeah because you know there are those people who like stealing power cables it happens every now and again i think five or six times um the power cables have been stolen this side never used to happen in the previous neighborhood where we were staying but in this area unfortunately it's a common occurrence so we have to you know, have to deal with that as well. The thieves haven't been caught yet, so you would be right to suspect that maybe um, the same people who want to help out um, replacing the cables, they might be involved in stealing the cables. Wouldn't be a surprise. So that also delayed uh, me in getting this episode out. But lucky enough today, I finally had the chance to record. So here we are with the episode. I'm sorry for the, the late delay. I'm hoping to, hoping, you know, nothing like this happens again, but just in case, you know, just be aware that this is the sort of thing that will happen in this area. Yeah, so anyway, that's the end of the episode. Brought you up to speed. Um, I guess let me just end with some good news while I was away I have recorded the next episode of Counting Electric Sheep so that should be out um, next week after this episode has been released so please look forward to that please look forward to the next episode of Tintin's Audio Adventure again, reminder book 4 is Cigars of the Pharaohs so if you happen to have a copy of that book, or if you don't, I'll try and search, please search the Internet Archive. Maybe you'll find a copy there. You can start reading, and if you have any feedback, you can, you can send that feedback to me as well. So again, thank you for listening. Uh, please look forward to the episode. If you'd like to support me for this series or any of the other content that I put out, there will be links in the description as well. So you can have a look at those links, support if you can. Thank you and enjoy your Thursday, enjoy your weekend, take care.